Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue, and we have Pursue 6S, which is liver and GI pathology, and we are streaming live from Kolkata. And today's topic is very interesting: epithelial neoplasm of colorectal region. And to talk on that, we have Dr. Bhaskar Mitra, who is an MBBS from Kolkata and MD, a DNB in pathology, a gold medalist in pathology. He is a consultant histopathologist in the famous Tribedis and Roy Diagnostic Laboratory, Kolkata. With multiple publication in index, national and international journal, he is also a reviewer of uh, various journals. Before I ask Dr. Bhaskar Mitra to start, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request Dr. Bhaskar Mitra sir, please share your screen and let us start. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Everybody. I think uh, uh, I we can see your screen. Yes, please start. Visible and audible to everybody. Yes, yes. So, yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for this uh, introduction. And from here, I will take this topic. Uh, as the series of GI lectures are going on, uh, my topic is very limited uh, on the limited thing. But uh, today, I will like to. Address some practical issues regarding this colorectal cancer's detection and its histopathological interpretations. Okay, to start my uh, lecture, first I will start with an honest confession of my career before my pass out and after my pass out. So before uh, my pass out, initial or just after my pass out, in the initial phase of my career, when I uh, started the pathology practice, the colorectal cancers, I thought it was a very easy one uh, because it is difficult to get a diagnosis of an ovarian neoplasm, uh, a retroperitoneal soft tissue tumors, a brain tumor. I find it very difficult, but I thought, oh, colon cancers, okay, it's no problem. Okay, I just get it. And uh, it's adenocarcinoma invading the muscle and that's it. Okay, now after day by day, the things goes on, more depth of knowledge and things are getting uh, increased. We are facing day to day very practical issues on it. Now I really found sometimes very difficult to get this uh, proper diagnostic reports on this. So, starting with this, some basic top, uh, that's, this is the one of the most common malignancies in the female, third most common in the female, uh, male patients. Um, obviously, most common malignancy in the GI tract, it may be synchronous and the metachronous occurrence, peak incidences in the elder age groups. 
Site of, among the site of involvement, rectum is the most common site followed by sigmoid colon, then the, so then the cecum, then the other areas of the colon, splenic fractions are the less common one. Now, it may involve the right colon, it may involve the left colon. Okay, right colon usually presented as a ulcer of fungating masses, usually have a good prognosis and the left colon, they are usually presented with the annular constricting and stenosing growth with the features of bowel obstruction, having a poor prognosis. Patient may present with a pain, mass uh, in the abdomen with obstructive feature. Bleeding per rectum is one of the most important factor as it goes more distal, as its rectum is more um, find the symptoms of bleeding per rectum. Right cases more we presented as a mass lesion there. So the, these are the basic signs and symptoms. Now coming to the pathological part, it's on the macroscopically it may be presented as an annular constricting growth like a ring or it may present as a tubular growth it's like a pipe part of a pipe or it may present as an ulcerated lesions ulcer proliferative lesion or it may present as like a cauliflower like growth these are the different morphological gross presentations of the colorectal tumors now today I will try to address this following things. Okay. So this following key issues is my today's focus of my lecture. First of all, the morphological variation or morphological classification. The pathological staging issues, not the basic TNM staging, we all know. But we try to address those practical staging issues here. Then coming to the prognostically important features of colorectal cancer which we have to notice properly and report it properly so that get implicated to the or transcript to the uh, clinician or oncologist so they get a clear idea about the prognostication of this colorectal tumors. Now coming to the, then comes the differential diagnosis of the colorectal cancer, the most interesting part particularly we will address the mimickers, then the vast one that is the molecular pathogenesis and its application. Uh, I try to address this issue in a gist, in a simplified way, in a short. Many things can be addressed but in a small way I will address this, not the whole of this. Coming to the morphological classification of the colorectal epithelial tumors. Uh, if, uh, one thing I try to focus that uh, today I my topic is main on the epithelial carcinoma because neuron dependent drug is already there. So I will mainly focus on the colorectal carcinomas. Now colorectal carcinomas is mostly are the adenocarcinomas. But definitely they have variations. These are the different type of variation. It can be intestinal type of adenocarcinoma. It can be micropapillary, cribriform, comedotype. It may be of serrated adenocarcinoma, mucinous adenocarcinoma, signet ring adenocarcinoma, medullary carcinoma, and there are some rare variants like adenoscoma, spindle, undifferentiated, choriocarcinoma, even the clear cell adenocarcinomas. Now, here we try to focus on the most important points. But first of all, is the intestinal type of adenocarcinoma which we usually see in our day to day practice. Okay. Here the malignant glands harbor a typical columnar epithelial cells, some of which contains the cytoplasmic mucin vacuoles. And sometimes they contain so much of that mucins that cytoplasm appears clear. There may be subnuclear vacuolation of these cells and they may mimic like the secretory endometrium. Okay. Now these are usually most well differentiated tumors with the prominent tubulovillus or villus, a different combination of architecture. Characteristically, they even statistically show CD, uh, cytokinetin CK20 and CDX2 positivity and negative for CK7. As we know, the distal part of the colon cancers are more of CK20 positive than the CK7. Now, coming to the micropapillary carcinomas. Here we can see the small solid cell cluster with a, within a lacunar space they simulate like a vascular invasion like this okay 
Now here there is a peripheral glycoprotein that is a Mach 1 is there which causes a inhibition of interaction between cell and stroma that causes the in characteristic interpret uh, appearance of this uh, shell out type of or separate type of morphology of this cells. These are the micropapillary carcinomas. They usually are the microsatellite stable cancers. Okay. Now coming to the cribriform or comedotype of adenocarcinomas. Here the name suggests the cribriform. Here we get somewhere the sheave like appearance of these cells. We may found the fused necrotic gland, necrotic uh, fused gland pattern of these growths. There may be luminal necrotic area. This has got a importance because if we see this type of morphology in the histomorphology, uh, this cribriform comedotype may usually are the microsatellite stable and CIMP positive, that is a CPG island hypermethylation type positive cancers are like this type, show this type of morphologies. Coming to the serrated adenocarcinoma. Serrated adenocarcinoma has got a typical gross morphological appearance. It's like a plate-like nodule in a associated with a sessile poly. Here the neoplastic glands are of serrated architectures and often have an eosinophilic cytoplasm with a large nuclei and a prominent nucleoli within the cells and have very high degree of dysplasia on the cells. They may show cribriform or mucin pools or signet ring cell appearance. This serrated adenocarcinoma, these are the infiltrating carcinoma in a background of developed in a serrated polyp. Then the another one, there is a mucinous adenocarcinoma. We call it mucinous adenocarcinoma when there is an extracellular mucin amount is more than 50%, the magic number, more than 50%. They usually are microsatellite in stable carcinomas, MSI high, and there are free floating strips of tumor cells within the mucin pools, or there may be presence of mucin field signet ring type of cells within the pools of mucin. Okay, they may arrange singly or like strips. This is a characteristic appearance of the mucinous adenocarcinoma. Now coming to the signet ring carcinomas, here we found a huge number of at least more than 50% of the tumor volume consisting of the signet ring cells. They may arrange in single codes, sheets, uh, there may be pools of mucin in which the signet ring cells may get, we get floating of this. This is also again a microsatellite instable high frequency, this type of carcinomas. Uh, they may present in combination with the other type of carcinoma presentation. Here is the um, signet ring cells with the presence of a moderate differentiated classical intestinal type of adenocarcinoma. Here there is a sheets and nest of mucin filled signet ring cells throughout the cancer. These are all a, a morphological uh, pictures of the signet ring cell carcinomas. Now coming to the this group, this is the medullary carcinoma. The name suggests the medullary carcinoma. There is a syncytial growth pattern of these cells. They again are MSI uh, instable carcinomas. Usually occurs in the proximal pollen. They have display a expansion growth pattern with a syncytial nest of cells and intermingling with a large number of lymphocytic infiltration in the stroma. The cells are of polygonal types with the abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and a large nuclei and prominent nucleoli among these cells. So this characteristic syncytial growth pattern and large number of lymphocytic infiltrate uh, there may be Crohn's like lymphoid reaction, I am coming to this letter, uh, in this medullary carcinoma. And this is the rare variety of colonic choriocarcinomas. There is a component of adenocarcinoma is there associated with a large number of highly atypical mononuclear cells with the abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. There may be areas of hemorrhage necrosis, presence of cytotrophoblastic and syncytial uh, trophoblastic cells are also there. This is a rare variant we rarely encounter, but we may encounter this 
type of carcinomas in the colon. So these are the important morphological variation of the colonic cancers, among which the mucinous, the medullary, and the serrated ones, they usually present the microsatellite instable genomic behavior. Now coming to the issues regarding the pathological staging and its implementation. Regarding the pathological staging, particularly I like to highlight this one, and although it's already described in the polyp segment, uh, the polyp may have different depth of invasion and they is called the habit levels of invasion. It may uh, not, that is zero level, only tip of the polyp involved. T1 just muscularis mucosae involvement followed by involvement of the neck region that is a level 2. Level 3 is the stock invasion. Level 4 is the submucosal invasion. And in the sessile adenoma similar type is there. This is the different level of invasion of the polyp cases in which the tumor has developed. Now coming to the basic clearing. The TNM here, this is a stage 0 intermucosal. As it goes on, the submucosa muscle core invasion goes on. It goes into the deeper part of the and the stage and TNM changes along with number of lymph node involvement. This is the basic of TNM, TIS, in C2, submucosa, muscularis propria invasion, T2, pericolorectal tissue, T3. N04, N2, 4 to 6, N2, A, more than 7 is N2, B. This is a metastasis, distant, and this is a Duke's classification as per penetration of the muscle layer and the lymph nodule. This part we all know. Now, here lie, starts my important issues. Now, when we call at this, sometimes it is very difficult to get uh, differentiate that the intermucosal carcinomas to differentiate it from the submucosal invasion. Now here we have to focus on the two things. In the intermucosal carcinoma may show an expansion type of growth like here. There is an expansion type of growth is here and the adjacent but the growth if we see in the high power it definitely doesn't involve the muscularis mucosae. It is only restricted up to the lamina propria level. So that is an important thing. And another thing is the submucosal part, if you see, there is no desmoplastic reaction. That, these are the two salient points we have to focus. That is the involvement of the muscularis mucosae and the presence of desmoplastia. Coming to the submucosal invasion T1 tumors, here we can get there is an irregular infiltrative growth of these tumor cells in the submucosa. And there is definitely there is a desmoplastic reaction adjacent to this tumor component. Okay. Now coming to the T2. This is we found a relatively easier part where we can see a definite invasion into the muscle lab but we have to demonstrate the typical muscle fiber penetrating invasion here. This is a T2 tumors but remember one thing sometimes people say there is only one two strands of muscle is there should we call it T2 or it T3. When only one single strand of muscle is there beyond the advancing age of the tumor, we still call it T2. Okay, not beyond that, we don't call it T3. Now, coming to the T3 tumors, the tumor has extended into the beyond the muscles, that is the subcellular fat fibroadipose tissue or perimuscular fibroadipose tissue. Here the tumor is infiltrating into the perimuscular fibroadipose tissue. Uh, somebody in the mic is on. I think uh, he should silent that. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, now this tumor is uh, infiltrating into the pericolic uh, muscle or perirectal soft tissue component. Now, there is an important thing. We have to get a clear idea. Sometimes 
there may be presence of pollen diverticulosis and that diverticula may extend into the herniation of the mucosa may extend into the colonic wall colonization of the cancer cells among these diverticulas doesn't make it t2 or t3 it still remains in the t1 stage okay so that part we have to interestingly look for in the diverticulosis again that irregular expansion type of expansion type of growth may be there but that irregular deflectastic reaction in the surrounding tissue may not be there but in the invasive one there may be an, a huge number of invasion and infiltration will be there now regarding the pericolorectal invasion some of the studies have shown the depth of invasion in the muscular mucosa beyond beyond the muscular mucosa can be graded as t3 and t3 c and d as per depth 1 mm 5 mm 15 and beyond 15 mm but usually in common practice we don't do this we put it as a t3 uh, then then the most important part is the t4 now we always try whether we call it t4 a where the tumor penetrates the peritoneum and involves the peritoneum or it directly invades the adjacent or contiguous structure which is t4 b now this is Uh, there is a an important thing I will suggest in the cross specimen. Look for any area with a puckering of the serosa. Before opening the things, if we turn the specimen and look for this area of puckering, if we get this area of puckering, get the sections from there, you will there is a more chance of getting a tumor invasion or penetration at that site is very important. Now these are the cases is very easy because here we can see the tumor is going and transgressing the hole of the serosa and presence of mucin and the neoplastic glands in the serosa. So this is a clear cut stage T4 disease T4 eight cases. Now coming to this stage, what we call this? Because now here we look for. Other things. Now there is another. Some of the centers they also do a cytological scraping of the serosa from those uh, suspicious areas and get the cytology. That will be also helpful. If we get on the cytology those positive tumors, that will be very easy to call it a T4. But usually very less centers do that. Very less common practice. Commonly not done. Now there may be some amount of granulation tissue present. Suppose if the tumor is present within one millimeter of the serosal involved serosa, uh, then we still it is a involvement of the serosa. Okay. If we get the free tumor in the serosa, is involvement. Sometimes there may be associated with the presence of this granulation tissue or typical inflammatory granulation tissue like area in these areas. And associated with a mesothelial hyperplasia, this fibroinflammatory response may still can be seen in those T4 cases. Now there again there is a fibroinflammatory response with a mesothelial hyperplasia. Now if we get a neutrophil rich peritumoral abscess, that signifies. A presence of tumor perforation because always remember that the neutrophil rich peritumoral abscesses does not signify any host immune mediated response. It's just because of the fecal matters or any tumor cells that going beyond that area leading to development of this abscess. So there must be any point of perforation is there so that this neutrophilic abscesses are created and this significant. Secondly, suggests the perforation of this area. So these are the things we have to look for carefully before doing that proper TNM staging because the T3, T4 that makes a huge difference in the treatment. Now coming to the local regional metastasis, we all know we can get the lymph nodes harvested and count the lymph nodes. Okay, now. We get the number of positive lymph nodes by number of uh, total lymph node examined, and according to this, there is a TNM staging. The M status signifies, but there may be 
less than 2 mm then we call it micrometastasis number of regional lymphos showing micrometastasis n1 micro n2 micro is there if it is less than 0.2 mm then we call isolated tumor cell deposition may be there these are the small tumor cell deposition now coming to another interesting topic that is the satellite tumor deposits in the peritumoral regions now here i like to share one simple history that is if you see the hsc tnm from the fifth sixth and seventh it followed the different rule first it was a rule of 3 mm rule of 3 in which the 3 mm rule we considered the if the tumor is within the this satellite nodule the first of all what are these satellite tumor deposits satellite tumor deposits it's are the they are the islands of tumors in the vicinity of the peritumoral regions particularly the subcerebral fibro pericolorectal fibro adipose tissue they do not show any residual lymph node tissues they may or may be surrounded with the muscle tissues on this we will try to first off it is the when the three millimeter rule is there there the tumor nodules spanning at least three millimeter were considered to represent completely effaced lymph node regardless of their morphology and classified as a n category in the smaller tumor nodules they may be classified as in the t3 category as invasion of the tumor like vascular or perineural invasion in the tnm5 now hss 6 this changes it to the contour contour rule if it is a well demarcated rounded one like this then we consider this as a ins category as if it is an irregular one then we consider uh, this in the vascular invasion category now coming to the tnm7 these rounded tumor nodules that are discontinuous with the main tumor are classified as a positive lymph node n1 n2 strong if no residual tumor is there and there are other evidence of lymph node metastasis in this tumor then it will be considered as a number of lymph nodes if the whole other number of lymph nodes are negative then this nodules will be considered as n1c so and this number of tumor deposits should be counted and documented into the report there may be suspicion of the a large venous invasion if we find a tumor nodule adjacent to the artery and if there is an artery and there is a presence of tumor nodule without any residual lymph node tissue if we see the muscle layer around this then this definitely to be an angio invasion or venous invasion or vascular thrombi is there now this identification of the muscle is very important uh, because they signify the vascular invasion in these cases. Now uh, com then comes the tumor nodules in the pericolorectal fat that is the pericolic fatty tissue that is a multiple well defined and uh, well defined nodules of tumor in the discontinuous fashion they will be considered as a metastasis that is the m1 or m2 as per number of metastasis will be there now here they are may be associated with mesocellular hyperplasia with typical samometers calcification along with this we have to differentiate it with the, from this mesothelial hyperplasia cases now after the TRM, we have to look for this prognostically important features in the uh, colorectal carcinoma slides first of all that is the independent factors are the complete excision of the mesorectal envelope that is the total mesorectal excision that this part is very uh, vividly uh, discussed in the gross part and how the total mesorectal excision will be considered how it will be you know, get that is uh, already has been discussed now coming to the number of harvested regional lymph nodes here i will like to highlight two points the number of lymph nodes both the number of tumor involvement and number of tumor lymph node harvested is important first of all due to the reasons of stage migration that is if we get 10 lymph nodes getting 7 positivity it's okay fine or 5 positivity if we harvest 15 lymph nodes then it will be 
more chances of getting more positive lymph nodes so that the TNM will be more specific if we harvest more number of regional lymph nodes. So that helps in the stage migration of this tumor. First of all, second is the host immunity. If we get more number of uninvolved nodes, suppose we get 5 lymph nodes out of 10 in an out of this, if we get a 5 lymph node out of 30 lymph nodes, there the number of non-involved lymph nodes is more. So that signifies the increased host immunity against those tumors. So that is also important. So number of lymph nodes harvested is an important prognostic indicator. Particularly now we are studying more on the T3 N0 cases where the lymph nodes are there but lymph node is not involved. We commonly encounter these cases. Now the tumor perforation again is a bad prognostic factor uh, for the uh, tumors. Now coming to the individual histological grid. Now WHO uses four tier rating system. First is that is uh, well differentiated, more than 95% GLAD formation, 50 to 90% grade 2, 5 to 49 grade 3, less than 5%, that is the uh, undifferentiated. So well moderate, poor and undifferentiated carcinoma, AGC grades a low and high grade, that is a G1, G2, that is a more than 50% gland formation is a low grade, less than 50% gland formation is a high grade. Now as the grade increases, there is a prognosis will goes down. These are the different grades of colorectal cancer, that is a well to moderately differentiated cases and these are the poorly differentiated cases where there is, a, in this case, there is a, this is the undifferentiated one, this is the, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get, uh, diagnose those adenocarcinomas here. We have to take the help of the special stains or uh, immunostimistry. This is signaling carcinoma, again the poorly differentiated group. This is again the poorly differentiated carcinoma group. Now, another is tumor border configuration. If the border, invasive border is well circumscribed with a small, well advancing form, then it has got a improved and better survival of those colonic cancer cases. Compared to those cases with the ill-defined borders or infinitative border, these tumors are more aggressive one than the this tumor. So the tumor border configuration again becomes an independent prognostic factor in determining the prognosis. Now coming to the important one, that is the vascular invasion and perineal invasion. Now these are the different vascular invasions and there you can see the perineal invasion, they are all the bad prognostic factors. Now regarding the vascular invasion, I will try to clarify more. What are those vessels involved? Is those the, the small vessel involvement or they are the large vessel involvement? How will you define small and large vessels? Small vessel includes the lymphatics, capillaries, post-capillary venules and the small things. And the large vessel includes that is the endothelium line spaces with an identifiable smooth muscle layer. This or elastic lamina is there. This can be better delineated by using an elastic tissue stain. And use of elastic tissue stain also improves the better detection of those angioinvasion cases. Now we have to look whether this vascular invasion is on the intramural part that is within the muscle layer or it's beyond the muscle layer that is the extramural part. Okay. If the small vessel involvement is both intra and extramural involvement suggests more chances of lymph node metastasis. This is important. Small vessel involvement both intra and extra it suggests of more lymph node metastasis. Now if the large vessel involvement is there, if and it is on the extramural part, it suggests more chances of getting a liver metastasis. So this signifies that EMVI, extramural vascular invasion, suggests more chances of liver metastasis and poorer prognosis. And the intramural large vessel invasion part and its importance still indeterminate. So the small vessel involvement suggests even more lymph node metastasis. EMVI suggests more chances of liver metastasis. Now there are two important signs which we can see. One is that orphan arterial sign. 
these are nothing but tumor deposits adjacent to the arterial here we use the elastic stain here there is a tumor deposit but there is adjacent arterial this is called orphan arterial sign this is again a bad prognostic factors another is the protruding tongue sign okay it's nothing but the elongated tumor nodule extending beyond the pericolic fat from the muscularic posterior these are the muscle layer from here the tumor nodules are extending outside this is called protruding tongue sign here again the nodules are extending this is orphan arterial sign tumor deposit is adjacent to the arterial and this is protruding tongue sign now coming to the newer concept of tumor budding very less commonly we uh, report this in the report but in the cap protocol they say that you have to add this because they has got a important prognostic significance i will discuss this in details what is tumor budding by definition there is a presence of single or small cluster of cells but defining it less than 5 cells that is up to 4 cells at the advancing front of the tumor is considered as peritumoral tumor body now this signifies the increased risk factor for the nodal involvement suppose this is now in the histological site this is a tumor we have to arbitrarily draw a line through this and now we have to look for this small tumor body that is a one to four cell cluster beyond this now how it should be reported now there is an international tumor body consensus conference is there they evaluating the tumor budding they put some important criteria that is the tumor budding count should be done on the hn stain section not with the immunohistochemistry immunohistochemistry help may be taken if there is a inflammatory infiltrate obscuring the fields that may be helpful but it should be done in the hn stain section only next tumor budding should be reported by selecting a hot spots we have to take all the slides of cancer and its advancing age should be examined and the maximum number of tumor budding present in the field should be reported and the total number of buds should be reported per area of 0.785 mm square that is approximately some of the 20x ocular microscope in some of the cases but we have to take the cap microscopic chart of area of field involvement this is the area we have to look for now number of tumor buds are counted and it is reported in a three tier scoring system it is 0 to 4 then it is low 5 to 9 it is intermediate more than 10 then it is a high tumor body now what is this these are the areas of tumor body in the high part that is the tumor body cells single cells are there now what it impossibly do there is a surrounding desmoplastic stoma b suggests the epithelial mesenchymal transformation the tumor budding results from loss of intercellular junction and interaction between the tumor cells and stoma there may be expression of this uh, stem cell markers and more tumor budding considered among the macrocellular stable cases than the msi case in stable cases they are high tumor budding suggest poor prognostic factors now coming to host immune response and its prognostic importance that is the til tumor infiltrating lymphocytes they are present particularly in the msi cases in stable cases they are formed due to response to the new antigens generated by this tumor cells the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes they interdigitate between those tumor cells and usually present in the high number they can be of low numbers high number of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes suggest a good prognosis and good host immune response another good important host immune response is crohn's like lymphoid infiltrate these are nothing but the rounded lymphoid aggregates some of which contain the germinal center enmeshed with the stellate fibrosis lymphoid aggregates are usually located in the close vicinity of this tumor and its advancing age the particularly tumor crosses beyond the muscular mucosity with the typical lymphocytic with the lymphoid 
cell aggregates and the uh, lymphoid follicle transmission this goes like lymphoid response is very good and improve prognostic factor and usually seen in the MSI cases and again they show high good host immune response. Now which are the morphological findings? They suggest the microsatellite instability pathogenesis of this. First of all this clones like lymphoid response. TIL that is the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Morphological pattern of signet ring cell carcinoma, mucinous, medullary or poorly differentiated carcinoma. Those features are not seen in, usually not seen in the microsatellite instable cases like the lack of dirty necrosis, well differentiated tumors and good mucinous tumors are, uh, that is the well formed good well differentiated mutant tumor usually not seen in this medullary carcinoma is more in favor of microsatellite instable cases. Now most of the tumors are first down stage with the new adjuvant therapies nowadays to improve the surgical outcome and enhance the poor surgical quality of life. Now new adjuvantly treated tumors usually show presence of regression with the form of mural fibrosis, dystrophic calcification and pools of mucin there, as cellular mucin might be there. This may be present both in the primary tumor as well as the lymph node deposits and extent of regression is a good predictive marker of prognosis. There may be complete response where no viable cancer cell can be seen, moderate response where the single or small group of cancer cells, minimal response where the residual cancer is outgrown by the fibrosis or there may be extensive residual cancer as like the primary one or minimal involvement then that is a poor response, they have got a poor prognostic factor. Now coming to the most interesting part that is the differential diagnosis of colorectal cancers. What we have seen that is in the colon the adenocarcinomas. Now what are the differentials? First of all are we calling a benign lesion into invasive or an else pathology into a invasive adenocarcinoma? Third is another carcinoma to end GI primary adenocarcinoma. So I will divide this first the mimics of invasive adenocarcinoma. First of all are we calling a benign lesion into a carcinoma? There may be epithelial displacement or luminal or endoscopic trauma can show epithelium in the submucosal stock. Then we may erroneously call it invasive adenocarcinoma. There may be twisting of the polyp stop causing herniation of the mucosal elements through the musculus mucosa into the submucosa. Okay, just like this. There, there is a dilatation and it goes into the submucosa. Are they invasive? Or this is a polyp in the base of the polyp due to the endoscopic activity there is a herniation of this mucosal with the cellular pool within the submucosa. Are they invasive? No. These are nothing but the misplaced epitheliums or epithelial displacements. How to differentiate it from the invasive adenocarcinoma? First of all, glands arrangement. The misplaced epithelium usually shows a well circumscribed lobules. Look at this, they show an well circumscribed lobules. But here in the invasive adrenocarcinoma, they are the expansion and invasive pattern of growth is seen in this cells. First point. Coming again to the extracellular music, most of the cases in the misplaced epithelium, we see a cellular mucin pools. Without containing cells, there may be inflammatory reactions. Sometimes small amount of epithelia may be seen at the periphery of the mucin pools. But in the invasive carcinoms, we see the mucin pools containing strips or cluster of floating epithelia. A large number of tumor cells within the mucin pools which is lacking usually in the misplaced epithelia. 
third is the stroma response how the stroma reacts and the stroma is showing hemorrhage hemosiderin you know, but no desmoplastic reaction here the tumor uh, stroma is showing desmoplastic reaction now the most important point in the stromal reaction is presence of lamina propria normally in the misplaced epithelium lamina propria surrounds the tumor here we can see the lamina propria is well surrounds the tumor but in the cancer cases the lamina propria does not surround the tumor here there is irregular growth all places no lamina propria surrounding now coming to the epithelium usually the misplaced epithelium is if non neoplastic they do not show cytological characteristic of malignancy but in the invasive carcinoma the cells individually show the cytological features of malignancy so there we have to be very cautious don't call the misplaced epithelium into the invasive adenocarcinomas now distinguishing primary colorectal carcinomas from other entities most and most important thing is endometriosis we have to be careful because this endometriosis can give rise to symptoms and signs similar to that of colorectal carcinoma as per site of deposition endometriosis can be a subsidiary deposit patient presents with a pain abdomen and when the air is exploratory laparotomy we see multiple nodules at that it may be misplaced as metastatic tumor then we have to look properly next it may be mural endometriosis producing hypertrophy and scarring of the muscularis propria and giving rise to the obstructive symptoms it's like a mass effect it again mimics like an endometrial uh, it may mimic like a colorectal adenocarcinoma or it may be a mucosal deposit and present like a pseudopoly here we may misdiagnose those cases as a dysplasia among the polyps so we have to look here first of all the endometrial glands are round aggregates of the gland associated with the cellular stromal component the cellular stromal component is most important and these are the endometriotic glands around it continue with the presence of round stromal endometrial stromal component they may be associated with the hemorrhage but hemorrhage inflammation but it is a bit difficult uh, different from those dysmoplastic reactions seen in the colorectal cancers now involvement of the colorectum by the mullerian neoplasm most common is by the gynecological tract neoplasm carcinomas like direct extension from the gynecological tract or by the peritoneal seeding in the form of carcinomatosis or as a primary neoplasia arising from a pre existing endometriosis these all things can involve here the mullerian carcinoma may, if it shows a typical squamous or serous or mucinous type it may be Uh, easy to differentiate but otherwise sometimes it may be very difficult we have to take some certain points if we see the samoma bodies particularly in the serous carcinoma it will be helpful or else we have to go for the immunostimulant usually this mullerian neoplasms are ck7 positive that's a positive but the colorectal primaries are usually ck7 negatives and ck20 positive and that's a negative so these are the important points we have to look whether we are calling any mullerian neoplasm as a primary colorectal next another important thing signet ring cell carcinoma and undifferentiated carcinoma we have to be very cautious while dealing with this if we see this there we can see sheets of signet ring cells but what thing avoids the presence of intervening normal looking colony cracks so we again go to stick to the basics we have to see a dysplastic colony glands before calling this signet ring cells as a primary signet ring colorectal carcinoma because there may be sheets of signet ring cells they may come from the carcinomas from lung stomach breast or there may be melanomas that involves the colon that giving rise to typical this signet ring cells appearance okay here the key point is presence of non malignant colony glands within the sheets of signet ring cells we have to look forward for this the melanoma they show the typical 
pigment deposition which may be helpful in the bizarre looking cell. Even sometimes the hematological malignancies may occur like the uh, FDC interdigitating genetic sarcomas. We have to carefully look for presence of again the basic the presence of dysplastic glands. If we don't see any dysplastic colonic glands there then we have to, to be very cautious. Then we can help the take the immune histomastic help the CK20, CDX2, cadenin, these are more common in the colorectal, TTF1, more on the lung, ER, this is the breast and mullerian carcinoma, WT1, serous carcinomas, taxate the mullerian origin tumors and the thyroid tumors, S100 for the malignant melanomas. The panel of immunomarkers will help to differentiate this uh, other cancers involving the colon. Now coming to the molecular pathogenesis or molecular tumorigenesis part, of this colonic tumors. Now, colonic tumors usually show a chromosomal three way of pathogenesis. That is the chromosomal instability, mismatch repair pathway, and epigenetic gene silence pathway. And they occur in the three forms. First of all, hereditary. That is a family history is there. They usually present at a young age group, and presence of other specific tumors or defects are there. Sporadic absence of family history generally affect the older people or familial where the increased risk in which the index case is young and close relatives may be involved. So we have to divide this hereditary, sporadic and the familial cases. Now they follow this typical adenoma carcinoma sequence that is a normal colonic epithelium leading to dysplastic iodine crypt or fossil then forming the early adenomas intermediate adenomas, late adenomas followed by carcinoma and ultimately metastatic colorectal carcinomas. Now first is the FAB that is the familial adenoma that's polyposis. This we all know 5K21, the autosomal dominant group, they may present with the other extra intestinal manifestation like desmoid tumors, medulloblastoma, may be associated with the Gardner or Cray syndromes where may be associated with the other features like fibromatosis, cutaneous different medulloblastoma in the cranial syndrome case, Tarco is associated with Lynch. Okay. Now, how it happens? First of all, there is a germline or inherited first hit mutation in the APC 5Q21. Followed by there may be methylation abnormality or other abnormality in the APC beta catenin gene. That will lead to the mucosatrius. Followed by proto-oncogenic mutation of the other thing, the add-on, that is the KRAS, followed by P53, loss of heterogeneity and SMAT4 mutation. That lead to again adenomas to the other things. There may be overexpression of COX2. That is a pro-angiotectic factors. If there is a mutation of this COX2, that will lead to more formation of the vascularity, ultimately tumor growth and forming the carcinomas. Other additional genes may be there. So, sequence-wise, the different mutational thing causes chromosomal instability leading to this colonic carcinomas. Now, here we like, I like to a bit highlight more thing. This is a basic undergraduate pathology book picture from the Robbins. Here we can see the APC is a tumor suppressor gene. Here, the beta catenin normally goes directly into the nucleus and they cause a cell proliferation. And now APC is there to stop this beta catenin and causing degradation of this beta catenin. If there is APC is mutated, then the beta catenin goes straight, so there is proliferation. Or if there is a beta catenin may be mutated or WNT signaling is there, that causes decrease in the APC mutation. Uh, causing APC mutation, then again there may be proliferation. Now this is the undergraduate picture. Now I will complicate this. Here we can see normally the APC is there and the beta catenin is there. Normally glycogen synthesis kinase 3 beta along with APC and beta catenin when there is a no WNT signaling, they cause this beta catenin ubiquitination by phosphorylation of this threonine residing part and they degrade so there is no cell proliferation but when there is a WNT signaling there there is a phosphorylation of the W axing protein in the cytoplasm 
that it causes in again phosphorylation of this habile protein in the cytoplasm this causes interaction of this glycogen synthesis kinase beta catenin apc complex this causes the damage of this apc to binding with the beta catenin so the beta catenin becomes stable it directly goes to the nucleus and it binds with the t cell factor and lymphoid factor enhances the cyclin d1 and c and causes the cell proliferation this is the actual picture here now there is another issue of epidermal growth factor receptor egfa now egfa receptor is over expressed normally in the community uh, epithelium and 80 to 100 percent in the colonic epithelium they causes once the egfr is activated by this growth factor they causes phosphorylation or start signaling either through the ras ramp map kinase pathway or through the pi3 mtor pathway this is important now suppose this egfr is mutated this causes increased stimulation and causes cell signal now regarding the new adjuvant therapy we can provide anti egfr molecule by anti egfr treatment that causes stoppage of this colonic cancers but we have to look for before giving the egfr anti egfr treatment whether there is a any ras mutation or braf mutation is there if the ras and braf is mutated down stage so that will causes ineffectiveness of this anti egfr treatment so ras and raf mutation has to be looked for before giving the egfr treatment and the same time the pi3 kinase mutation also have to be looked for before giving it because this mutations causes ineffectiveness of the anti egfr treatment now ras may be mutated i will go directly to this here the growth factors attaches with the egfr this causes activation of the ras this activation of the ras causes ras map kinase pathway and leading to the cell cycle progression gap is there that causes the ras gtp ras to gdp ras and inactivation if the ras is mutated gp ga uh, gap cannot bind to this and so there is a continuous proliferation again if there is a lab map kinase or the ras mutation is there so again that growth factor receptor anti growth factor receptor protein will not act now braf mutation is what there is a changing in the uh, serine threonine group in the v600e valine to uh, glutamate transmutation in there so leading to the braf mutation and this causes resistance to the anti gfr therapy there may be p53 mutation p53 causes guardian genome it causes if there is a damage in the it stops the cell cycle and allows the cell to repair if the pp3 is mutated the cells won't get time to repair and there is also decrease in the apoptosis loss of heterozygosity again causes the increased mutation dcc or deleted in the colorectal cancer this tumor suppression gene mutation again also causes colorectal cancer now the other part that is a hn species where there is a non hereditary polyposis coli group here there may be defect in the microsatellite instability in the dna repair gene that is msh2 msh6 mlh1 and pms2 here this group may be associated with lynch1 where only colorectal cancer is there they have got the typical morphology of the poorly differentiated mucinous and signaturing histology associated with the other non intestinal tumors like endometrial gastric and ovarian tumors here there may be mutation on this mlh msh pms this group followed by addition of the more microsatellite instability with there followed by a other that is the tj beta backs and other mutation that causes normal colon followed by sessile serrated adenoma and ultimately to the carcinoma group that is the mismatch repair microsatellite instability pathway another is the 
TIMP pathway that is the CPG island methylation phenotype pathway. The methylation causes silencing of some of the gene. Now, if this methylation occurs in the promoter region, they cause a silencing of the different gene on causing loss of gene function. That may be in the form of tumor suppressor gene involvement, APC involvement. So that causes loss of group of gene and this will lead to again colonic carcinoma by the CIMP pathway. So, if we think it in a simplified way, it is two groups. One is chromosome instability group. That may be sporadic, associated with the APC, P53, KRAS, loss of heterogeneity group. It may be germline with the APC mutation. There are some polyposis coli group where there is an absence of APC mutation. There is, we, there we find MUTYH mutation germline in these cases. These are the chromosome instability group. Now the MSI group, the Lynch and the sporadic. Lynch is a familial one where we get a germline mutation of this uh, different mismatch repair genes. And another is the sporadic where maybe epigenetic silencing, hypermethylation or BRAS mutations there. So we have to differentiate with the battery of test. Now what? The algorithm we use, we use for the MLH, we use mismatch repair genes. Immunostimistry test can be used for this, for loss of both MLH and PSM2. The gene likely defective is MLH1. MSH2, MSH6, then MSH2 is the likely gene effective. This is the heterodimer group. There may be isolated loss of PMS2 or MSH6 and this also causes the different defective genes. Now what we do? First of all, if we get a colonic cancer, we first go for mismatch repair gene detention that is the MM, MA, MMR instability by microsatellite instability group. First we test in the either in the form of uh, immunistic chemistry or in the form of PCR we do it. If we found that there is no MMR instability, it is probably not Lynch syndrome, that is a CIN group. Or if it is there, then in which group it is affected? If it is abnormal MLH or PFSN, but that this MSI group, that is where is MSH to MSH, if it is there, there may be germline mutation, this may be germline Lynch group. Or if it is there, then we go for the BRAF mutation. If it is mutational type, this is probably sporadic type. If it is normal, that is a wild type, then we go for MLH promoter methylation. If it is positive, then it may be again sporadic group or if it is negative, then we have to look for germline testing of MLH1. This spreads the different, um, the fund allocation is important for this uh, treatment sequencing. Now these are the different treatment according to the stages and we, uh, the different colorectal carcinomas have been offered with the different chemotherapy region that is the normally FOLFOX and the NEWS that is the EGFR inhibitor and the VEGF inhibitors can be used. Again the EGFR inhibitor has to be first tested for the EGFR mutation then the KRAS and the BRAF, if the KRAS and the BRAF mutation is there, then we cannot, this EGFR inhibitors will not be effective in those cases. So again, the tar as per targeted therapy, we have to utilize this, that is the colorectal cancers with MSI testing in PCR, it is MSI instability. We go for the BRAF, if it is BRAF mutation, then it is uh, for the sporadic cases. If it is ISC for the MLH loss, it will be again genetic and it may be in other group, it may be on the MSH2, PMS2. If there is a KRAS mutation, anti-GFR will not be effective. BRAF mutation is there, anti-GFR will not be effective. These are the targeted therapy algorithm is used there. These are the Bethesda guidelines in which determines the screening tool for the different HNPCC. I am not going details of this. Uh, these are the different screening tests 
for the colorectal cancer like the fecal fecal occult blood testing immunological testing for fecal obt colonoscopy sigma testing molecular markers testing and non invasive cancer marker is again important for the screening diagnosis and particularly the prognosis molecular uh, testing can be important for the uh, personalizing the targeted therapy response and also the follow up of this different the pcr method or the immunostimulant based method can be used for the molecular diagnostic testing so my take home message for this is the proper gross examination for the looking for the important points like total mesorectal excision number of tumor harvest lymph node harvesting uh, that is the presence of any perforation at the different area in the microscopy we have to look for the tumor budding i will must highlight this point again the msi associated morphological feature has to be included in the report now again important is check for the mimickers whether we are calling any benign malignant or any other malignancy into a malignant colorectal cancer and last of all this vast molecular pathogenic and diagnostic part we have to carefully look for these are my references and thank you everybody and merry christmas to all of you uh, for uh, listening this uh, my presentation thank you dr baskar <coughs> at the beginning when you said that it was just a limited topic i <laughs> thought it's it's unlimited and i think you did justice by explaining to us in the end that it is the, there is no limit to colorectal tumors <laughs> it's a huge topic in all international conferences there is a full session on colorectal tumors you have done a wonderful job you have really explained well not only the histological part but also the molecular part as well also the carcinogenic part the neoplasia part the how the whole thing works out most of the young people have no clue as to how this whole msi braf things do work what is the exact molecular or the neoplastic you know pathogenesis but you have explained that in detail i'm so happy for that a wonderful presentation dr baskar mitra god bless you very nicely done thank you i tried actually sir i tried mostly the small things i what i feel very difficulty those small small thing whether we call it perforation or to that part i i tried yes. i, I was so happy to listen to that mimickers the mimickers are so important i mean uh, it is so so important and many people have made mistakes you know in trying to not exactly. understand that these are mimickers and not actually malignant many a times you see pools of mucin in various inflammatory conditions various uh, you know uh, because of iatrogenic uh, you know activity and um, we we generally need to keep all that in mind you have really you know as uh, you know assimilated a very nice uh, talk and i'm so proud of you and i think all those people who will listen to this in, in the youtube and further on will definitely benefit for that thank you dr baskar for this wonderful christmas present to all of us thank you so much god bless you take care bye bye okay bye 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 good night